We are getting underway tonight. Welcome, welcome to everyone joining us for our first ever Scully Academy classroom experience. Uh, as you can see on the screen in front of you, we have a packed house tonight. Um, I am by far the least important person on this Zoom call tonight, but you're going to have to listen to me talk for a little bit until we get underway. Um, there are lots of smiling faces in front of you, pretty much smiling for the most part, because uh, we're excited to be here and we're excited to share a little bit about what a Scully Academy writing classroom looks like. For our attendees joining us live tonight, welcome. Um, I'm going to kind of introduce our live event tonight and walk you through what we'll be doing. Um, uh, for anyone watching this in the future, we're glad that you are tuning into the recording. Uh, we hope that this is beneficial for you as you survey Scully Academy and live online writing courses and get a gauge on how Scully Academy uh, really does create a different atmosphere in its writing classroom and the writing and rhetoric department um, here at our school, which has been uh, around now since 2014. Uh, I know that it's hard to believe sometimes, but we are headed uh, into 2022 being the eighth year. Course registration is now open for 2022-23 classes, and we're excited about that. Um, so again, everyone who's joining us live, welcome. I'll give a few more minutes for late attendees to trickle in and kind of let everyone know what's going on here tonight. My name is Joseph Softley. I'm the webinar coordinator for Classical Academic Press and School A Academy. Uh, joining me tonight is Ms. Emily Brigham. Uh, Emily is a writing instructor. Uh, she teaches writing and rhetoric at School A Academy, and she is our guest instructor tonight. I'm also joined by Joanne Shinstock, the School A Academy director. She's going to share a little bit about School A Academy. And we also have the wonderful Amy Morgan, department chair of writing and rhetoric for School A Academy who's gonna be here to help with Q&A and answer some questions along the way, provide feedback. And most importantly, I have with me tonight five incredible Scully Academy students. Abigail, Alexander, Sarah Beth, Joel, and Ella are joining us from all over the country. And they're gonna take part in some of our live classroom activities with Emily, just to give you an idea of what a Scully Academy writing and rhetoric classroom is like. So I'm going to turn things over to Joanne here in just a second. Before I do that, I'll just walk you through um, asking questions and interacting tonight. Um, I'm sure this is not your first Zoom event. If you're joining us or watching this, uh, yes, we've been in the Zoom era for quite some time now. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see a chat icon and a Q&A icon. We are going to do a formal Q&A at the end of our time together tonight. If you have a question for Q&A, you can type it in that Q&A box at any time. Uh, the chat box is more of a feedback loop for typing in links and having conversation. Um, but if you want to post a question in the chat box, that's fine too. We ask that you try to keep questions reserved for the Q&A box. Um, but if everyone wants to kind of make use of the chat box right now and send out a message, Students, you guys can participate in that too. Go down to the chat box and just send everyone a quick note and let them know where you're joining us from tonight. I am joining from Hershey, Pennsylvania. And I'm gonna go ahead and type that in. And we'll see where everyone else is coming from. Hello, hello from Cherry Hill, Westfield, Massachusetts, California, Oklahoma City, Jacksonville, Saratoga Springs, <laughs> I love it. A couple Ohio's, Nevada, Texas, Indiana, Oregon, Kansas. This is awesome. Uh, quick math in my head. I think we've got at least 20 states represented tonight, if not more. And there's Canada. Melissa Brown, welcome from Ontario, Canada. Katie from Green Bay, welcome. Awesome. Okay, so we definitely know how to use the chat box. All right. One last thing for me, this event is being recorded. Um, so if you need to leave early at any point, don't worry, you'll be able to watch the recording. And if you're watching the recording in the future, great. That's why we recorded it. <laughs> um, tonight's gonna start out with a brief introduction of School A Academy, um, our online academy for K through 12 students, um, hosted by Classical Academic Press. 
featuring live online RESTful classical courses. Joanne is going to tell you a little bit about that. And she's going to introduce Emily, Miss Emily Brigham, our special instructor tonight. And Emily is going to tell you a little bit about her background. And Emily is going to introduce her five wonderful students who are on the call with us. Um, and from there, they're going to step into a little bit of a classroom activity of sorts, um, a couple classroom activities actually, and then we're going to end with a formal Q&A and try to get you out of here by eight o'clock Eastern time. Uh, so without any further ado, I will pass uh, the speaking privileges over to Joanne Shinstock. Take it away, Joanne. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I am so excited to see as many of you uh, here tonight as I do on the chat screen. Um, so as Joe said, I'm Joanne Shinstock. I'm the director and principal of School A Academy. I wanna share with you a little story about where we've been, where we are and where we're going. So as Joe said, uh, we started about eight years ago in 2014 with two classes and about eight students. Fast forward to our current year. So I'm talking about the 21-22. Uh, we are serving over 1,100 families in our school community, which includes the three houses of studies, um, St. Raphael School, Canterbury House, and the newly added Catholic House of Studies, the Aquinas House. So it is um, first and foremost a privilege to be welcomed into your home through this online platform to partner with you and to um, teach your children. Um, and to support your homeschool program. So that's what it's all about. Um, and just, it's a joy to work with uh, you all. And so I'm grateful uh, for those of you who are here tonight to learn more about um, our classes, our teachers, and just the specific ways that we can support you. So here we are, 21, 22, 1100 families. We have just recently launched um, opened enrollment for the 22-23 academic year. We are offering over 95 courses, which means we have over 200 different uh, unique sections, um, Monday through Friday, eight to five. So we're working with families in North America and international. Um, so we are just so excited that we have grown from, like I said, those two classes, eight students, to here we are to over 200 unique um, sections for you to pick from. Tonight, the live classroom experience is going to give you a chance to see our philosophy of education in action. Our learning in our classroom is a place where our students experience restful learning, um, learning that is personal, classical, and engaging. So let me introduce to you Emily Brigham, Miss Brigham, um, where you can experience tonight just a little bit of what our students experience, uh, not just in Miss Brigham's class, but in classes that we offer across many disciplines at School A Academy, uh, where we foster delight and wonder. So Emily, I'm gonna pass it to you. Thank you, Joanne. Well, I'm so happy to be here tonight and um, really excited to get to share with you a little bit about writing and rhetoric classes. It's been such a privilege and a joy for me to be teaching these classes the last few years. So I'm excited to uh, show you all a little bit what that's like. Before I get started though, I wanted to introduce my students here. Um, they are currently in my Writing and Rhetoric 2 classes, and I just want you to get the chance to know them a little bit. So I will say your name, and then if you could unmute yourselves, feel free to wave and let us know where you're joining from. Let's start with Sarah Beth. Go ahead, Sarah Beth. Hi, I'm from Tennessee, um, Nashville, Tennessee. Go ahead. Let's go to Ella. Hi, I currently live in Tampa, Florida, but I actually, this year, we're going to be temporarily moving in Texas, moving into Texas. I had the fun, fun privilege of meeting Ella a few months ago when she was driving through my city. Go ahead, Abigail. Hello, I'm from Cerritos, California. And Joel. Hi, I'm from Winnemucca, Nevada. And Alexander. Hello, I'm from Winnemucca, Nevada, too. Joel and Alexander, as I found out after my first day of teaching them, are best friends. They're kind of like the three musketeers, but without the third one. So we could call them the two musketeers. Go ahead, Alexander. Well, I actually have another friend, but he doesn't do, uh, he doesn't go to school, eh? 
So it's the mysterious third musketeer that I have not yet met. So you will be hearing more from these students as we go into our classroom experience. But first, um, they uh, asked me to share a little bit about uh, my background and specifically in education and classical education. So uh, my experience with classical education, I distinctly remember it. I was four years old and I was sitting with my sisters as my mom was teaching us ancient history. And I remember as a four-year-old being fascinated by the pharaohs, but I couldn't pronounce their names, but I loved hearing their stories. I was also at five years old, um, terrified that the Minotaur was going to come find me while I was sleeping. So that is my introduction to classical education with uh, history and literature and all the wonderful subjects that uh, are unique to classical education. So I was homeschooled all the way through uh, from preschool up until I graduated high school. My mom homeschooled my two older sisters and I, and she homeschooled us classically. And it was always something that I loved. I never wanted anything else. I loved my subjects. I loved my teacher. I loved all the assignments that I had. But as with so many things, it's not something that I fully appreciated until I didn't have it anymore. So after I graduated high school, I went to the University of North Florida, where I majored in uh, elementary education. And um, throughout that experience, I interned in a lot of schools across the city, and they were all public schools. And it was then that I realized just how much I appreciated the kind of learning that I had been given growing up. And I saw so clearly its, its worth and its value. And as, as I was, you know, teaching in these public schools uh, across all the elementary grades, there were two things that really struck me in each classroom. And that was, first of all, how vulnerable children are. And second of all, how, how easily formed they are by the things around them. Whether it was you know, not just the subjects that they learn, not just the knowledge they're being given, but the routines that they have every day, the decorations around them, the, the conversations they hear, the music they hear. And as I was in these classrooms, I just, I saw that so clearly how every single part of their day, their school day, was forming them either for something virtuous or something not virtuous. And ar around that time, I read C.S. Lewis's Abolition of Man, and in there he quotes um, Plato. And this, this quote became something that I really have come back to so many times. I'm going to read it real quickly. It says, the well-nurtured youth is the one who would see most clearly whatever was amiss in the ill-made works of man, and with a just distaste would blame and hate the ugly even from his earliest years, and would give delighted praise to beauty, receiving it into his soul and being nourished by it, so that he becomes a man of a gentle heart. All this before he is of an age to reason, so that when reason comes to him, then, bred as he has been, he will hold out his hands in welcome, and recognize her because of the affinity he bears to her. And that idea of having an affinity for the good and forming that in children from the very earliest age was something that really convicted me as an elementary school teacher. So after I graduated, I taught in a uh, Waldorf-inspired public school for a few years, and I loved the experience of learning about educating the whole child and integrating art and music into all the subjects. But after a few years in the Waldorf world, as much as I loved it, I also wanted to return back to my classical roots. And at that time, I uh, was introduced to Scolay Academy and began teaching there. And it was, I loved how it took all the things about Waldorf education that I loved with the whole child and the art and the music and then combined it with the classical piece and a liturgical learning and restful learning. And it was such a gift to me as a teacher to enter into this sort of environment and get to teach um, classically and liturgically and restfully. And really that idea of formative learning that what a child has in a class is what is forming them. So I have loved getting to teach for Scole. One of my uh, reservations, some that some of you might have is well, I love interaction and how does that happen on an online setting? And as I've taught longer with Scola, one of the ways I like to explain it to people who ask me is I like to say, well, Scola is kind of a no technology online school. And that might sound a little strange, but it has it's it's as close to being in person as you can be. I, I get to see all of the students and they see me and we have lots of discussions. Just ask any one of these students here. 
we, we talk a lot in our classes, don't we? I talk a lot. They talk a lot. A lot of times we go late because we all like to talk a lot. So there's so much interaction. Uh, one of the things I love is that we don't have a chat box. None of the school day classes have chat boxes. And while I know that students might like those, I love the fact that it uh, really gives space for communication, spoken communication. So I think one of the, the biggest things I have loved about Scully is how similar it is to being in a classroom with students and the kinds of things that I get to do with them, even though we come from all different parts of the world. So I love that relational piece. And then also uh, the liturgical piece and the, the idea of liturgies in a classroom and the habits that we have. Uh, again, if you ask my students, there's a lot of habits that we have in our classes. We start the same way every day. We end the same way every day. They they know what's coming. I know what's coming. And it just it gives a beautiful routine to those classes that we have. And that's that's something across all the school life classes, that restful piece, the habits that are built into it. And it's something that I have really treasured as I've gotten to teach here at school life. So you're going to get to see a little bit of that tonight as we do a writing and rhetoric lesson for you. I teach writing rhetoric one currently, and I love, I can never decide which class I like better. Each class, can, they are very convincing to me that they are my favorite, and they like to argue that point and practice their rhetoric skills. But I love teaching both of those classes. Tonight, we are going to be uh, taking some exercises from the writing and rhetoric one book, um, and that's what we'll be sharing with you tonight. So we will go ahead and get started with how we always start class. So if you would pray with me. O oh, most loving Father, who willest us to give thanks for all things, to dread nothing but the loss of thee, and to cast all our care on thee who cares for us. Preserve us from faithless fears and worldly anxieties. And grant that no clouds of this mortal life may hide from us the light of that love which is immortal, and which thou hast manifested unto us in thy Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, we are going to be talking about the story of a prodigal son today. Who remembers what type of story is the prodigal son? I almost told you, but I caught myself. Ella, what type of story is the prodigal son? A parable. And how could we define a parable? What is it that makes a parable a parable? Alexander? Isn't it a, a, a story, a short story with a heavenly meaning? Good, a short story with a heavenly or a spiritual meaning. Now, it does, in some ways it has some similarities to a fable, right? The same with the fable, we have a lesson at the end of it. Now, what distinguishes a fable from a parable? There's one big difference. Sarah Beth? Um, in a fable, animals are always acting as the people. Exactly. And what do we call it? Here's your bonus question. What do we call when animals act as people? Joel, you're ready. What is it? Anthropomorphic. Anthropomorphic. So we have anthropomorphic animals in our fables. In a parable, the prodigal son is not a rabbit. It is not a uh, bird. It is a person. So we are going to start by, I want you all to narrate this story back to me. Okay. So we are going to start with one of you and then I will stop you in the middle and then we're going to go on to the next person. So let's get started with Abigail. Start us off with the story of the prodigal son. So the youngest son of the family, he decided that he was bored and that he wanted 
<clears throat> to go out into the world. So he asked his father if he could have his money, and he took a portion of his father's money and went off into the world. Good. You can stop right there. Let's go to Ella. Well, he went to a lot of parties and uh, he bought a lot of new clothes and basically wasted his money on things that he didn't really need. Like he bought more clothes and shoes and jewelry and a bunch of other meaningless things. And then he realized that he had no more money, no way to get home. And he so what did he do, Alexander, when he found out that he had no more money? He went to go work and he was like feeding the pigs and then... Uh, his the pig's food looked better than his food so he decided that he was going to walk back to his dad's house and he was going to tell him that he wanted to be one of his servants but his dad walked him walk oh you took sarah beth's part go ahead sarah beth so um he decided to go home to his father and he was going to tell him that he wasn't worthy to be his son and asked to be one of his servants and so he went home and his father was waiting for him hoping he'd come back and instead of greeting him and telling him he was worthless and that he had been horrible, he his father ran up and hugged him and met him halfway to the house and asked the servants to kill the fatted calf and have a huge party. And he invited all the neighbors. And, and what happened next? And then um, the older son became jealous because he had worked so hard for his father and he had done all these things. And he realized that his father had never thrown him a party. And so the father came out and the elder brother asked him why he had never done any of those things for him. And why he didn't. Let's go to Joel now. Joel, what did the father say when the son got upset? Um, I just need I kind of forgot. Ella, do you remember what he said? He said that even though you are my oldest son, uh, he has been gone a really long time. And it's understandable because, you know, if your son leaves for a super long time, you're like, he's back, throw a giant party. And you feel so much better than you did before. Like half of you was gone and now it's brought him back, been, been brought back to you. Good. And it's really freeing you. Good. Alexander, what do you want to add to that? He said, that has been lost, has come back. Mm -hmm. Very good. Sarah Beth, did you want to add to that or did Alexander take yours? Well, kind of, it was kind of like the same sentence, but he said he, um, he was lost and now is found. He was dead and is alive again. Very good. Excellent. Give, your all, give, give yourself a pat on the back since I can't do it. There you go. Good. So we know the story of the prodigal son. Now we're going to do a few things with that story, but before we do that, I want to talk about this painting here. So this is a painting, The Return of the Prodigal Son by Rembrandt. Give me a thumbs up if you're able to see this right now. Okay, so I wanna give you a minute and I want you to ask yourself the question, what do you notice in this painting? Now, obviously we see people and they're doing something, but I want you to get a little more specific than that. What are some things that you notice when you look at this painting? Alexander, what do you notice? The prodigal son, it looks like he has really ragged clothes on. Why do you think that is? Probably because uh, he was like feeding the pigs and he didn't really have enough money to buy himself new clothes. Sarah Beth, what do you notice? Um, one was the ragged clothes, probably also because of the famine and like his, um, and then he's missing a shoe. Like one was probably worn down. Yeah, let's look at that. So we see that he's missing the shoes. This is actually one of my favorite details in this painting. So we have the prodigal son missing a shoe. Now, I want you all to think carefully about this. What other story in the Bible does somebody not have their shoes on? Or take off their shoes? Joel, can you think of another one? Um, no, I had a different thing about the story. What, can you save yours for just a second? Write it down in case you so you don't forget. Alexander, what other story um, do we see somebody else taking off their shoes? Make sure you unmute yourself so we can hear you. Uh, when God takes the form of the bush, but he like lights on fire and Moses takes off his shoes mm -hmm. because he's in the presence of 
Good. Remember, God says, take off your shoes for you are on what? Do you remember what he says, Sarah Beth? Holy ground. You're on holy ground. So do you think there's any connection between how the, the painter painted the prodigal son with his shoes off? Do you think that's supposed to bring to mind anything about, about Moses there? About Moses taking his shoes off? Sarah Beth, what do you think about that? Because it's kind of like he's coming back to his father. And I think in this story, the father's almost supposed to be representing God. Like not like he's kind of the figure and he's coming and he's he's apologizing. And so he's kind of being reverent almost. Excellent. He's being reverent in, in a sense. It's, it's a sacred place that he is. Abigail, go ahead. I was about to say the same thing that Sarah Beth sa said in the fact that they're both bowing before um, a higher one or one that is forgiving. Exactly. Very good. Joel, do you want to tell us what else you noticed? Um. Uh, like you can tell that uh well first you can tell that uh he uh has that he has wasted all the money because uh his clothes are all rags. But you think if he had just gotten a bunch of new clothes, uh they wouldn't be like that already. You would think that maybe he had to sell them just to get some some food, right? Ella, what do you notice? Well, uh, I noticed his brother just standing in the corner like, whatever, I'm older than you are, I'm cooler than you are, mm -hmm. and I didn't foolishly waste the money my father gave me. Good. So, uh, kind of wondering what's going on and why, why is this all happening? Alexander, what do you want to add? I see that his dad isn't really, uh, his face. He looked compassionate instead of like having hatred because or like uh because of his son good abigail i noticed that everyone else in the picture besides the brother um they kind of look forgiving and understanding mm -hmm. compassionate again sarah beth um i noticed that like he like his head it's kind of like that everyone else is like wearing hats and full head of hair and I don't know if that like would mean anything but he just kind of looks I guess just so like ragged and stuff. Do y'all remember that in the Old Testament sometimes shaving your head was a sign of repentance of mourning? So maybe that's another thing that the painter is trying to bring bring to mind just show us that the the prodigal son he's he's repentant when he comes back right he's not arrogant he's not haughty he's coming with humility and with with repentance there. So as we think more about this story, we're going to go ahead and summarize it now. Now, what is the difference between summary and amplification? Joel, what's the difference between summary and amplification? In summary, uh, in summary, you're like taking out details and uh, trying to like shorten a story and amplification is adding details and description. And which one do I like doing more? Sarah Beth, which one do I like doing? Pretty sure you like amplification better. <laughs> amplification, yes. We're going to try to do that today, but we are going to start with summary, which I think you all like better. So we're going to shrink the story. And remember, one of the ways that we like to do that is by thinking about the three main parts of the story. What are the three main parts of the story? If we're trying to split it up, sometimes we draw a, a picture with three parts on it. What are those three parts? Abigail? The beginning, the middle, and the end. Good. So let's work with it that way. Okay, so let me, um, I don't have a whiteboard, so we'll have to do it in our heads. So let's think about how could we summarize just the beginning? Can you put the beginning of the story into one sentence? Not two sentences, just one. Alexander, what could we say? There was uh, two sons, and one of which wanted to go explore the world, so he uh, told his dad to give him his inheritance early. Good. So we could say um, the, the younger of two sons wanted his inheritance early. Now, let's add one more thing. What did he want to do with that money? Did he want to go invest it? Did he want to go give it away? Sarah Beth? Um, I would just say for the beginning part, um, the younger of two sons wanted his inheritance from his father so he could spend it on luxuries and just wa and waste it. Good. I'm thinking of the word squander, so he could squander it. Let's go ahead and write that down, okay? So on your piece of paper, write down the younger of two sons. 
This is like dictation, dictation practice now. The younger of two sons wanted his father's money. To spend it on luxuries. Give me a thumbs up when you're done. Okay, so that's the beginning. What happens in the middle of the story? So he goes, he wants to spend all the money. What does he do with it? Joel? He uh, uses up all his money and in the end is forced to... Uh, and the, in the end, uh, the uh, pig's food looks better than his own. Good. Or we could say he, he's forced to tend the pigs. That sound good? So let's write that down. The younger son spends all his money and in the end is forced to tend the pigs. Give me a thumbs up when you're done. Now, I think we need to add an extra sentence here. Because at the ending, that's when he comes home. But what happens before he goes home? What, are, what is his thought process before he actually decides to go home? Let's add one more sentence. It'll be like our second middle. Go ahead, Abigail. What could we write? Decides to go back to his father and say, I'm sorry, um, I do not deserve to be your son, but your slave. Good. He decides to go back to his father. And say, I am not worthy to be your son, but a slave. Now we come to the end. So what is the last thing that happens in this story? How could we summarize the end in one sentence? Ella? He goes to his father, apologizes, and his father doesn't even care that he spent all his money. He's like, you're back. It doesn't matter what you did with the money. It just matters that you're home again. Good. So how could we sum how could we fit that even make it even smaller? Alexander, any ideas? The father is forgiving and throws him a party. Why does he throw him a party? Uh, because that was lost. Is has come back. Okay. So let's say the father forgives him. and throws a party let's say to celebrate the lost being found Who would like to read for me the summary that we just wrote together? Abigail, do you want to do that? Go ahead. The younger of the two sons wanted his father's money to spend it on luxuries. He spends all his money and in the end is forced to tend the pigs. He decides to go back to his father and say that he doesn't deserve to be his son but his servant. In the end, his father forgives him and throws a party for his homecoming. Very good. Go ahead, Sarah Beth. Do you have something a little bit different? 
Well, I was gonna say we left out the part with the older son. We didn't leave out that part. So how could we add that to the ending sentence? Um, we could say the father, um, when he returns, the father is gracious and throws him a party, which makes the older son jealous. Good, let's add that. So uh, when he returns, the father forgives him and throws him a party, which makes the younger son, the older son jealous. Let's add that part. So we just took a story that was three pages and we shrunk it down to four sentences. Now, after we do that, we want to make sure that we got all the all the main points in there. Remember, a story needs to still give us what the story is mostly about. So we take out the details, we take out the description, we take out the dialogue. We want to make sure that we have the main idea. So look over that one more time and make sure that we have all the main component components of this parable. Is there anything else that we missed or is there anything else that we could still take out? Sarah Beth? You could say something about he has to become um, a swineherd because of the famine. Okay, so let's go back to that middle sentence where he said the younger sp son spends all his money and in the end is forced to tend the pigs because of a famine. That sound good? Let's add that in. Does anybody see anything else that we could either add or take out? Joel. I could ask, could you repeat what uh, that sentence we just wrote down? Uh, the younger son spends all his money and in the end is forced to tend the pigs because of a famine. That's in the second sentence that we wrote. Well, we need to wrap up just about now, but we are gonna do one last thing. I know that you all love it. We're gonna do the um game. So just in case you forgot, the um game is when I give you a topic, you have, it's, it's rhetoric practice. I give you a topic, you have to talk for one minute without saying um. If you say um, you're out, okay? I have here our mug of doom. I will pull your name out, whoever gets pulled out. We'll have to do it. Before we start, does anybody not want to play the um game? Wow, all right, well, let's see who gets chosen. I'm gonna get my timer ready. You have one minute, and the first person is going to be, hold on, gotta find somebody here. A Bunch of you are jumping out of the mug of doom, so apparently you guys are really excited. All right, let's start with, Abigail, I would like you to talk for one minute without saying um about let's do what is your favorite part about writing in rhetoric too? Ready, set, don't say um. Ready, set, go. My favorite part about writing in rhetoric too is that I love how I can talk with all my other friends and I feel like they're my friends even though they live so far away. I feel like all my classmates live right next door and I just know so much about them. And I love in the beginning of class, she, <clears throat> Ms. Brigham always asks us about what we did on the weekend and it's always interesting to see what they talk about. Another thing I really like about writing and rhetoric too is I love all the projects because I find that they're challenging but really fun and I definitely learned so much. And another thing is I really enjoy playing the um game, which is what I'm doing right now. Every student <clears throat> loves to do it. And one of my other favorite things is I love the format of the books because I they're so engaging and they're not boring. Good job, Abigail. Round of applause for Abigail. Yes, Alexander, I know she said um, but it was part of the title of the um game, so that doesn't count. Okay, we have time for one more. Who is it going to be? It's going to be Alexander. All right, let's hear from you. What is your favorite part of writing in rhetoric too without saying um? Ready, set, go. 
My favorite part of writing and rhetoric too is my teacher. She is very good at teaching and I also like all the projects and like all the things that we get to do and I get to be with all my friends and I like that my uh, teacher is very nice and I also like that we get to share stuff at the beginning of class and I also like that we beginning we begin class with prayer and end it with prayer and I also hope that she can teach writing and rhetoric three next year and she uh, can teach all my grades till I graduate to college and because she's a very good teacher and she gives me a lot of help and she it has enhanced my rhetoric skills and my writing skills a lot these past two years I've been in writing and rhetoric and good job Alexander round of applause for Alexander well I liked that one that, that was a nice one you made me nervous a few times you almost said um but she caught yourself so good job all right, everybody. Well, we are all out of time for doing the um game. Thank you all for coming tonight and for learning about the prodigal son with me. And I will see you all next week after winter break. Bye. See y'all later. Bye, thank you. Thank you. They were incredible. <laughs> that was uh, special to see. Emily, I, thank I you for. Students. I think they are pretty incredible students. All, all of my students, I'm pretty biased towards. Thank you for leading them through that and uh, giving us and everyone else uh, on the live event and anyone who's watching the recording a chance to uh, experience some dynamics of an online classroom. Uh, Seven forty-five. We wanted to set aside about fifteen minutes for Q and A, and it looks like we're going to do exactly that. I'll, I'll open up. Joanne by revisiting a few questions that were asked earlier. Uh, both of them I thought were great, great questions and we can breeze through these because I know you typed something up in the chat box. But uh, Leah asked, how many students are in a class typically? So could you go over the class dynamics and size and why that's important uh, for School Academy? Yeah, absolutely. So we cap our classes at 15. Um, sometimes uh, depending upon, obviously we had COVID, um, there are during COVID season, we might have had some classes that had 16 or 17, uh, but typically we cap our classes at 15 uh, and for, for that reason to have this individualized personal um, engagement that we have in our classes. And the average class size for this year is 11. That means obviously some classes will be 15, some classes will be uh, less, but we run all classes with two students or more up to that 15. Thank you. Uh, Emily asked a good question about summer classes. Emily, we're going to get to that towards the end. Um, do, we definitely don't want to leave that go because that's that's a good question about why summer classes aren't currently listed on the site. We'll come, we'll review a little bit as to when they will be listed and what will be listed. Uh, for now, I'll go to Terry's question, which was, what kinds of projects assignments are required of the students in a writing and rhetoric class? Emily or Amy, would you like to take that question? Emily can start by sharing about her writing and rhetoric two class, and then I'll say something about three, four, and five. So in writing and rhetoric, uh, I teach one and two, so those are the ones I'm the most familiar with. In writing and rhetoric one, really the, the two main things that we are working on are the skills of summary and amplification. And we revisit those throughout the whole year. And then it's a skill that they will carry on then to writing and rhetoric too. So I would say summary and amplification are uh, both really major pieces of those first two years. Um, along with that, we have the daily activities. Uh, they, we call them sentence play and copiousness. So it's working with sentences to um, really use words to express exactly what you mean and not just generically what you mean. So th that would be like the daily exercises. In writing and rhetoric too, we also have longer narratives. So in the first semester, they write a historical fiction narrative. And then in the second semester, we begin working on creas, which are six paragraph essays. So that would be for writing and rhetoric one and two. And um, some of those elements carry over into three, four, and five. Um, especially the copiousness of sentence play and um, an occasional summary. Um, 
But in three, four, and five, there are essays ongoing about every other week um, once we get started. Usually the first uh, month or so is of a book, whenever we start a new book, the first month or so is usually introducing some new skills and adding some tools in the toolbox. And then the remainder of the quarter or semester is usually of essay writing. Um, but some projects, somebody asked about projects, not just assignments. And so, oh, actually I'll say one other thing about assignments. Um, we also have an oral component. And I mean, actually the um game is a fun example of that. So there are um, oral assignments sprinkled throughout the textbook or whatever we come up with is too. Um, memoria quotations are something that happen in my classes in levels three through five where students are collecting quotes and poetry that they accumulate like a library in their mind throughout the entire year. And they share those with each other and they also are assessed about them and uh, uh, ongoingly. Um, sometimes there are dramatic readings that we do and some students uh, sometimes we just read it and other times we take our time and we develop it and I've seen students go into like puppet show mode where they have had some time to prepare ahead for the dramatic readings and here they come with with some um, puppets on sticks or maybe they've gotten costuming and arranged with their partners to have the same background so it looks like that they're in an English garden together even though they're actually in like 500 miles away and have siblings come and and help with props and things like that. And, um, oh, I was gonna say, uh, debates, um, discussions and debates that, yeah, start to develop in the late, we, we work on discussion skills and some specific discussion skills and debate starts to come in the higher um, levels of writing and rhetoric in addition to the writing assignments. Great, thank you both for that answer. Uh, Rebecca has a, a, a quick question too that kind of aligns with projects and um, assignments, but more of a quantity question, and that is how much outside homework time is expected for level four students. Um, I'd ask if, if you guys could expand that and just kind of take um, writing and rhetoric through all levels and talk about how that homework time, uh, kind of what is it for level one, level two, and how that would increase potentially as the students get older. Do you want to start, Ms. Brigham? So in writing and rhetoric one, um, it keeping with this school idea of gentle learning, I, I find that the younger students, they get tired easily when they're doing writing. And so writing rhetoric one, I would not say is very homework heavy in terms of independent homework. Um, I would say about, it's hard to put a time, time on to it. I usually have about one assignment a week that they're working on independently and turning in. The rest we do in class and that way, you know, I'm walking them through each assignment. Writing and rhetoric too, especially second semester, it's definitely more of that. They still have, you know, one to two assignments a week, but they're a lot longer. And then we will also have multiple drafts of them. So it really depends on what we're working on at that time. I would say anywhere from one to two hours writing rhetoric too when you're working on those projects. Um, and I usually, I usually tell families to think about the writing class as a four to five day class. So on the day that they're having class, they probably aren't going to have homework to do that day. Class time is that time. But on the days that they're not having it, on um, if they have a Monday, Wednesday class, then they should expect to have homework on Tuesday and Thursday. And maybe some spillover into Friday so that Friday is some makeup time. So um, if we're just doing exercises, some of the exercises are, I would say maybe half an hour, maybe 40, half an hour for exercises and maybe some memory work. But when we are writing essays, then it, it depends a bit on the, the child because different children and, and teenagers write at different speeds. But I, um, I give some time in class, especially for our first essays so that um, I can see what they can do, um, how, how much they can write in 15 minutes and, we're also building fluency in by writing in our commonplace journals. Uh, we maybe every week or every couple of weeks, we write for 10 minutes in class about our memoria quotation. And that just helps them to build fluency and realize that they can write a certain amount in 10 minutes. So I do that all to help keep the homework load restful and be mindful of that. Great, thank you guys. Uh, moving right along. Uh, Mary Beth has a couple of good questions. Um, I'll ask one uh, first about new students. 
uh, if we are welcoming uh, a student um, perhaps into level three or level four, the student hasn't been part of school A from the beginning, hasn't been in level one, level two writing and rhetoric courses. Uh, how can a parent be sure that that student is going to be assimilated properly into new courses, potentially hearing new concepts, uh, terminology, and the dynamic of a writing and rhetoric classroom? How do we nurture those new students who join in later in the process? Should I answer that, Joanne, or do you want to? Okay. Um, so there's an assessment process as part of the enrollment process. And so you can make a good guess based on your knowledge of your, your child and also based on their age, because when you read the course descriptions, you can see what grades it's targeted towards and what will be, um, what will be taught in that. That usually gives you kind of a, a sense of it's either this level or that level. And so um, then you can enroll. And when, when that happens, then there will be an assessment done automatically, especially for new students in which probably a teacher will ask you um, to describe the writing instruction that they've had up to this point. Um, and it could even be writing that they did in their science or history or literature class. It doesn't have to be writing instruction, but what kind of writing experience and instruction have they had? And, you'll and your student will probably be asked to provide a writing sample that demonstrates um, some of the skills that would have passed. So even though some of the language that we use um, about writing might be different from the language that they experience in other writing classrooms. Um, you know, if it's a middle school student, they probably have been, they might have been doing some description already. They might have been doing some comparison already. They've probably talked about topic sentences and thesis statements in sixth grade in some other context. So um, we'll just see where they are along there and confirm their placement or make a recommendation. Um, also, there's the tutoring center, which maybe Ms. Shinstock might say more about. We'll, we'll go, I'll jump into that one right now because I have a, a question to tag along with that also by Mary Beth. Um, oh, can about... I just jump in really quick to, to add to that answer sure, of course. that Amy did? I, I, it's not gonna be about the tutoring center. So I, I, I don't want you um, to think I'm skipping over that. I did just wanna add for our parents, when you go to our course pages, there's a scholarship skills tab and this is for all of our courses, but we lay out for you um, skills that we say are either prerequisites, right, or that we already acknowledge that parents need to help their students with, and then the developing. Um, and this is very helpful because we'll touch on everything in here from the technology, uh, what a student should know how to do on their own, or perhaps obviously we'll need parent help, but writing, reading, typing, and then what's expected of them in class. So in addition to what Mrs. Morgan was talking about when you, you know, look at the course description, uh, you might even visit the CAP site to look at the table of contents. We try to give as much information as possible here because you are the primary educator. And so we ask you to come here first, read the description, look at the books, consider the skills. Um, and then from there, go ahead and make your enrollment decision. You can always call us um, or email directly any of our instructors to ask questions certainly to help you uh, finalize those enrollment decisions. But there is a lot here that we provide for you. Um, also in the student parent handbook, there's a whole section there on the steps to take for course selection. That was perfect, Joanne. Great. That, that was an A. That was an A to A plus use of screen sharing. <laughs> well done. Um, I'll, I'll tag on uh, where I was going to uh, in terms of using the tutoring center, perhaps for private course instruction, I'll let you go into that. Um, but through the context of students with learning differences, um, Mary Beth asked about students uh, with dyslexia and, and not being able to write or keep pace as quickly. Um, how does School Aid Academy accommodate students with learning differences uh, like dyslexia, particularly with writing and rhetoric courses Courses that, as we saw tonight with Ms. Brigham, are a little bit, uh, can be a little bit faster paced at times. Yeah, that's a great question and one that I'm excited to answer because when you look at uh, the services that we offer from course instruction, but also through the Center for Students with Learning Differences, we do believe that classical education is for all students, all um, learner types. And so with that, parents have the option, of course, to 
um, enroll in a corporate class and partner with their instructor, but they can also seek services in the Center for Students with Learning Differences and partner with a special needs instructor. And so then the parent sits in that driver's seat working with the uh, special needs instructor where they can have private instruction uh, through the Center for Students with Learning Differences there or have um, support. They can even have a um, recommendation plan uh, that is created for their child after consultation. Uh, they don't have to. We don't require our families to go to the Center for Students with Learning Differences. It is truly a service that is there should the parents want to um, take advantage of it. And then parents decide what information you know, they wanna share with their um, class instructor. Um, I think the typical scenario or one of the typical scenarios that can play out um, when a parent goes to register their child, we do want them to share as much information about their child with their instructor that helps us understand how they learn. That could include learning differences. It doesn't have to. I mean, one of my questions that I like to ask my parents is just to say, tell me how your child learns best. Um, tell me how your child studies at home. And those are the types of questions where as an online instructor, I can start to hear um, things that help me uh, craft instruction um, in, in the classroom or just to have a, um, a deeper understanding about that individual that's in my classroom. Uh, that parent partnership between um, instructor and mom and dad, it's really important to have those conversations. And then it's in that conversation that the classroom instructor can explain and be very upfront with the parent and say, okay, based upon the recommendations or this official report that a parent can bring and share, whether it's from um, a, you know, a, a typical IEP plan that they received locally uh, from another school, from um, another um, local um, service provider there, or someone through the Center for Students with Learning Differences has created a recommendation plan. But the parent, uh, we encourage them obviously to share that with the instructor, and then the instructor will decide what they can do in that corporate class. Um, we don't require our instructors to uh, make all recommendations or accommodations possible. It isn't always the case, but most times we are able to do um, the recommendations or modifications that make learning in the classroom very possible um, and joyful and delightful and successful for that student who has dyslexia or, or any of these learning differences. Um, you'll see when you go to the tutoring center, um, I know Joe was <laughs> joking with me, but it helps me because I'm a visual person. I have to see what I'm talking about. Um, so you'll come here to the tutoring center and when you click on, um, oh, pardon me. It's this button here talking about the Center for Students with Learning Differences. It'll speak to specifically the learning differences that we work with, dyslexia, dysgraphia, dyscalculia. Um, and then, of course, it goes into pricing and tuition um, and the different special needs instructors. And it's here that you start this process of requesting a consultation. So we try to lay out the steps um, and the places where uh, we can assist you and help you. Um, so hopefully that answers some of those questions. There's so much more to go into there, but um, certainly outside of this meeting, calling us or emailing us and we can continue that conversation. Okay, thank you, Joanne. Um, we're gonna wrap up here uh, with a, another, Joanne, maybe if you can go into a little summary of both our summer classes, uh, bird's eye view of what's offered, when we'll be listing those offerings and the time frame of classes. Uh, and then also um, another question that Emily asked, Emily, you asked about summer classes, also asked about tutoring services um, for second and sixth graders. Um, Joanne, as you're answering that, could you rope in a comment on uh, what we offer for the K through third grade uh, age range um, when it applies to both courses and the tutoring center? I think that would be really helpful in explaining how Scola Academy is truly a K through 12 um, live learning academy. Uh, and then after Joanne uh, answers those, if, if anyone does have any more questions, um, feel free to contact the Scola Academy team 
I'll drop in a link for the page um, where you can find full contact information. Also drop in a link for our FAQ page. Uh, both can be found at schoolacademy.com. And I know any, uh, anyone on the School Academy team would be willing to pick the conversation right back up and um, help you in the, in the days ahead, make the best decision for your family and your students. Um, so with that in mind, um, I'll turn it back to you, Joanne, to kind of answer these last couple questions from Emily. Yeah, sure. So um, we do have offerings for K to three. We have the Mommy and Me, which is a once a week um, online co-op experience where it's parent directed, uh, but the in instructor who leads that, um, we want parents to see that person as kind of the facilitator, the mentor, the coach, um, and students then have a chance to come to Mommy and Me and share their presentations, interact with other students, and that's K to three. In our houses of studies, we have at St. Raphael School, the liberal arts, um, the language liberal arts uh, programs. And so those start with the youngest learners as well. Most of our classes in the great hall start with grade four and for advanced third graders on up into corporate classes that are student directed. And as I said, the mommy and me, you attend with your children. Whereas when we're talking about writing and rhetoric level one on up, uh, well-ordered language, level one on up, um, our humanities courses in the lower school, those will typically start at grade four and um, carry on through there. We do obviously have our school online, but we also believe in um, not having a child in front of the screen for long periods of time. So we balance that as best we can, knowing with what our parents would like to see in our course offerings, um, we balance that with our philosophy of education. Um, so. The other piece there, looking at our tutoring center, yes, through our tutoring center, you can seek supplemental tutoring, you can seek um, the private course instruction. Um, that's actually one of our most popular options. So when you go back to the resources, um, or excuse me, academics and tutoring center, you can read about the differences there. Um, if you see a course and you really like it, but it doesn't work with your schedule, you can find private course instruction. We will do our best to match you with a tutor. And then you can work out that schedule. Um, and this goes in, into the details between um, the services and of course what that costs. And then you can see here, it's as simple as just basically reaching out to us, telling us what you're looking for. Uh, filling out this form doesn't commit you to anything. It just simply allows us to see your need. And then uh, we will have a tutor reach out to you once we make that match. And then you just continue that conversation with the tutor to decide if there's something there for you. Summer programs, we are going to launch those in early April with um, the time when we open enrollment for St. Raphael School. Um, and summer clubs, they're just a great time where it's really about fostering uh, enrichment, maybe refining some of our skills. I'm thinking of scholarship skills. We do that for the middle and the upper school. Those are really very popular courses. Um, we find that we have to add sections because our parents are asking for more of those. Book clubs, again, very popular. Um, STEM, art, um, just a variety of opportunities there where we don't do grades. Um, we don't even have the Latin designations during the summer. It's just really about getting together. Um, you can even take summer clubs as a way to kind of check out School A Academy. What is it like to be in a class? Um, get to know an instructor before maybe you take an academic year course with us. So there's a lot of advantages to the summer programs. They will start early June and end mid-August. They run for about five to six weeks each program, typically. We do have some outliers. We have one week art clubs, um, but for the most part, they are 10 to 12 hours across five to six weeks. And tuition is $150 per enrollment seat. Um, Joe, remind me what else was in that final <laughs> I know question. I I did give you a lot, <laughs> didn't I? Uh, K through three options for families with younger students. Yeah, so that would be when you're going to our course page, you can check out within the Great Hall. So when you hear the Great Hall, we're talking about School A Academy proper courses. This is something that I, I didn't go into um, too much detail, but when you enter our campus virtually, if you will, you come into the Great Hall and in the Great Hall, 
you see here our K to six courses. This is the, the mommy and me course that I was speaking of. We have three cycles for 22, 23, we're gonna be going into cycle C. Um, and so you can see there what the content will be and the time. Um, and this is, a, this is the 595 for the whole family. So you come with you know, your 10 kids, your two kids, your, your you know, only child, whatever your family size is. And it's called Mommy and Me, but we have a dad that comes. We can have grandma come or grandpa come. Whoever is managing, obviously, the, the schooling of your K-3 to group. Mommy and me is just the term that we landed on to uh, represent what this type of class is, um, being that it is parent directed, uh, but also giving the students an opportunity to present their work, to uh, learn from each other and to engage with other um, young learners. And they meet for one hour once a week. And then you can see here the other course offerings into the middle and upper school. Um, you'll see here when we talk about our houses of studies, um, Canterbury and Aquinas House. Aquinas is the newest house. And then if you'd like to go and check out, and again, right now we haven't yet launched the 22-23 um, um, course load. But so what you'll be looking at here is, is currently um, the St. Raphael courses, um, but you can see what those offerings will be. And it's the liberal arts levels one through six. Um, and you can see here, level one will start with your youngest learners. Now, these courses are, are taught through the lens of the Orthodox faith and tradition. So all of their teachers are Orthodox, but the students do not have to be Orthodox. Um, you just understand that as a family registering for these courses, that will be the, um, that is the Christian tradition that is um, represented in this house, whereas in the Canterbury, it's the Anglican and broader Protestant tradition, and of course in the Aquinas house, it is the Catholic tradition. That was a lot of information. Again, tour the website, tour our virtual campus, and then you can always email us or call us to continue conversation. And if you want to learn more, uh, join us the Scola Academy Open House on February 24th. It's Thursday, February 24th uh, from 7 to 8.30 p.m. Eastern. You can join for the whole thing, uh, pop in for a little bit. Uh, registration is open, it's free, and it's on the Scola Academy site right now, schoolacademy.com backslash events, um, or look for the events pathway in our drop-down menu. Um, and if you are watching this recording in the future, uh, you can find a recording of the Scully Academy Open House uh, to learn more as well. We make that readily accessible. Um, and that's always our most up-to-date version of our Open House. Uh, it's 8.10. I'm not surprised. Uh, we usually do tend to go a little bit longer when we're talking about something exciting and worthwhile. Uh, and, we, and we truly do believe Scully Academy is exciting and worthwhile um, because of the Christ-centered approach. Our award-winning courses, our expert teachers, our restful pedagogy. There are so many things that make this academy unique. Uh, I'm honored to be a part of it. I know these ladies would say the same thing. And if the students were still around tonight, I know they would agree too. Um, they were fabulous. And um, I know they, they can't hear me right now, but we're so, so thankful for them and their time as well. Thank you all very much for stopping by tonight, taking part in our first Scully Academy classroom experience. We're hoping to do more throughout the spring and summer in different subject areas, such as math, science, grammar, history, uh, and others. Uh, so swing back around to meet other instructors. Um, no, I'm sure Joanne wishes that Emily taught in every single discipline at School Academy, but she does not yet. <laughs> so Emily will not be here every single time, but come back to meet other instructors. Um, there will be a few instructors as well as department chairs at the open house on the 24th as well. Uh, Joanne, Amy, Emily, anything to add before we sign off tonight? I just want to say thank you. We're grateful that you're uh, coming here tonight to check us out. And um, like I put in the chat box, our doors are open. So please email or call and we will get you to the right person and help you with any enrollment decisions that you're looking at. Absolutely. Thanks, Joanne. Uh, God bless you all. Thanks for joining us and have a safe and a wonderful evening. Take care. Thank you.